Outcomes webinar series. My name is Laura Crowell, and I am a Natural Resources Communications Specialist with the USDA NRCS. We host this webinar series to provide key findings, data, and tools to support farmers and ranchers, other land managers, conservation partners, researchers, and others pursuing voluntary conservation efforts across the nation. We'll get started with today's presentation in just a moment, but first I wanna cover a couple logistics. If you would like to receive email um, notifications and, e and information on upcoming webinars, please subscribe to the NRCS Conservation Outcomes topic via GovDelivery. You can do so by following the instructions on the screen. And we're also going to post a, a direct link to access the subscription page in the chat. If you're having problems with audio, sometimes headsets can help. It may also help to leave and re-enter the webinar session. You can access live captions by clicking on the three dots with the word more. And then uh, we also will, you can find resources from today's event on our Conservation Outcomes webinar webpage, the recording of this event, as well as the, the slides from today's presentation will be posted there by mid-May. And we always encourage everyone to participate by typing their questions or comments into the chat throughout today's presentation. We will get to as many of those as our time allows at the end of the Q&A session. And if uh, we are unable to get to your question or you might have some follow-up thoughts, please email me at laura.crowell at usda.gov and we'll get back to you. With that, it's time to get started. And it's a true honor and privilege for me to introduce our NRCS national biologist, Daniel Flynn. Um, thank you for joining us today. All right. Well, thank you, Laura. My pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Welcome to everybody. Thank you all for joining today's Conservation Outcomes webinar series. Today's webinar uh, showcases work that's supported by USDA's Conservation Effects Assessment Project, or SEEP, to further develop and make available the Valley Bottom Extraction Tool, for application uh, for the in the restoration of floodplain hydrology and associated riparian communities. And for any of those who may not know or aren't familiar with SEEP, it's a multi-agency effort that's led by NRCS to quantify conservation outcomes and support resource conservation decision making. And then SEEP works closely with our science partners uh, both with, within other federal agencies and within academia to identify and address key knowledge gaps. And then this uh, Conservation Outcomes webinar series enables us to directly uh, report those results with all of you. So I was reminded that May is American Wetlands Month. So whether it was delivered or not, the timing of this webinar is excellent. Uh, NRCS, working with producers and alongside our many partners, has played an important role in wetland conservation, and that's evident in the conservation practices and the programs that we're able to offer, as well as fulfillment of our responsibilities under the Food Security Act. And this work continues to grow in importance. Um, the recently released Fish and Wildlife Service Wetlands St Status and Trends Report identifies that wetland loss rates have increased by 50% 50 since publication of their last 2004 through 2009 report. Our wetland work is varied and it's really at the forefront of what's possible, which makes it very exciting. Um, wanted to share a few examples, albeit with a wildlife bias, but um, I think that's to be expected given that 40% of plant and animal species live and breed in, in wetlands. So, of course, through EQIP and wetland reserve easements, we've protected and restored wetlands to provide critical uh, wintering and migratory habitat for waterfowl and shorebird species. Along the Atlantic coast, 
As a climate adaptation measure, NRCS is strategically acquiring easements in anticipation of sea level rise and the consequent uh, migration of coastal salt marshes into the uplands to ensure that enough marsh habitat remains in place to support those marsh dependent species in the long term. And then, while not technically work, wetland work in the uh, California Central Valley, flooded rice fields along flood control bypasses provide substitute Chinook salmon um, spawning habitat and also provide uh, passage from those flooded rice fields through the levied and fragmented delta back into the Pacific Ocean. So today we're going to round out our wetland portfolio by focusing on floodplain restoration. We'll gain insight into how the Valley Bottom Extraction Tool, or VBET, uh, can guide restoration efforts within an individual stream reach, such as the low-tech process-based restoration work that's being implemented as part of Working Lands for Wildlife to restore uh, mesic sage-grouse brood rearing habitat out west, but also how VBET supports scaling up of these uh, collective site level conservation activities to reconnect streams and restore riparian communities more broadly throughout the floodplain. So thank you again for joining us. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Joseph Pringer to introduce our guest presenters. Joe. OK. Um... Well, thank you, Danielle, for the, the introduction, and thanks everyone for joining us today for this overview of some work done by our partners at Utah State University. Um, I'm Joe Pringer, the, the NRCS lead for SEEP Wetlands Assessments, and as Danielle mentioned, the, uh, the goal of SEEP is to quantify the effects of conservation practices across the nation's working lands. And with wetlands, that's uh, often aimed at things like uh, how wetlands help to reduce nutrient runoff or store and release water. Uh, and, and more recently, there's been an emphasis on carbon storage and carbon processing. But um, we, we also provide information or tools to help target effective implementation of conservation practices which is what today's webinar is really focused on. Um, we've been conducting wetlands assessments in agricultural landscapes around the country for almost two decades now, but in the past, those have been focused on regions where there are lots of wetlands, or at least where there were historically a lot of wetlands. Um, so if you looked at a map of our previous projects, there was this really big hole out west in, in the Andrew Mountain region where we haven't done any seep wetlands assessments or seep wetlands projects. And um, that's for the obvious reason that there just aren't a lot of wetlands in those arid landscapes, at least in terms of acres. So, um, uh, but as our, our first speaker will point out, the, the rarity of those wetlands is in that area is actually what makes them all the more important to the ecology and resiliency of those ecosystems. So um, today's speakers will be talking about a tool that will aid in identifying stream and river floodplains and, and thereby potentially restorable riparian wetlands. Um, Jeremy Maestas is the, is the NRCS uh, sagebrush ecosystem specialist at the West National Technology Support Center, and he will text for this project, including the uh, the importance of wetlands in these arid regions of the country. Um, Jeremy will then hand it off to Dr. Joe Wheaton from Utah State University, who will talk about the development of this tool called the Valley Bottom Extraction Tool and, and the part that uh, Seep Wetlands funded, which is uh, really aimed at uh, uh, a tool to evaluate the outcomes of, of restoration and conservation practices. So um, I'll be back at the end of the webinar for the Q&A period, but uh, right now I'll, I'll hand it over to Jeremy to start us off. 
Great. Thanks so much, Joe. And I thank you for supporting this work through SEEP. Um, Joe Wheaton, you can go, go to the next slide, please. So put simply, in the West, water is life. Often representing less than just 2% of the overall landscape, wet habitats are indeed rare, but disproportionately important resources. Water from these wet habitats is not only the lifeblood of agriculture in the region, but 80% of all of our wildlife depend upon these areas at some point during their annual life cycle. For example, the photo at the center of this restored wetland now supports species like imperiled Lahontan cutthroat trout, all within a working cattle ranch in the driest state in the Union, Nevada. Next. We often refer to these wet habitats as emerald islands in the sagebrush sea because they stand in such stark contrast to the surrounding arid landscape. And most wet habitats are associated with our river and stream systems, which here today we'll refer to as riverscapes. Next. And while up to 80% of our watersheds in some areas are publicly owned and managed by agencies like Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, the vast majority of wet habitats are actually in private ownership due to historic settlement patterns. So this really places ag producers and NRCS in a unique role to help conserve and restore these important wetland areas. Next. And healthy riverscapes benefit both agriculture and wildlife. When we take a degraded stream or a meadow like the one depicted here on the left and restore it, reconnect it with its floodplain, we take advantage of nature's natural storage capacity in the form of those floodplain soils. So we can hold on to that moisture, that limited moisture we get in the form of snow or rain and make it last throughout the dry season. This not only boosts what we call the green groceries on the landscape that benefit livestock and wildlife, uh, making the land more productive and greener longer through the summer, but it also makes our working lands more resilient to drought, fire, and flooding that are all being exacerbated by climate change. Next. And one of the primary ways that NRCS has been empowering producers to improve their wet habitats, it's through our Working Lands for Wildlife effort, which is USDA's premier approach for conserving working lands for wildlife and people. Working Lands for Wildlife harnesses the power of the Farm Bill to deliver technical and financial assistance to landowners who voluntarily choose to adopt conservation practices to address uh, natural resource concerns such as riparian or wet meadow degradation, which is one of the, the primary issues that we're addressing through our Western sagebrush biome framework. And for a decade, NRCS and Working Lands have teamed up with Dr. Wheaton and his team at Utah State to build out a suite of technical materials, trainings, tools, and whatnot to help staff empower producers to scale up this voluntary conservation of riverscapes. So it's my pleasure to now turn this back over to Dr. Wheaton to unpack his latest uh, project to help us with riverscape planning and outcome assessments. Joe? That's great. Thank you so much, Jeremy, and also Joe and Danielle and Laura for setting the stage uh, so well. Uh, what I want to do uh, today in uh, talking to you about mapping uh, riverscapes to support productive uh, and resilient working lands. Actually, I want to start uh, just with a little bit of uh, acknowledgement and uh, 
reiterating thanks for the support from both the SEEP wetlands um, as well as SEEP croplands actually played into this um, effort as well um, and some of the development work to facilitate what we're going to talk about today. It's also investments from Bureau of Land Management. There's a large team of folks that I won't give enough credit to as we're going through who are really the magic behind this. I just get to talk about it, uh, but from North Arrow Research and Utah State University and under the sort of umbrella of the Riverscape uh, Consortium. But today, what I uh, what I hope to sort of get across, um, sort of elaborating on this stage that Jeremy set, is well, first off, what what is this this weird word, this uh, riverscapes, and why why map them? Um, what is the valley bottom extraction tool? And I want to take you through a few examples of uh, how we can use that to assess resources across different spatial scales. Um, zoom in to uh, individual sort of farm or ranch, you know, scale and talk about how we do project planning. Uh, and then uh, particularly uh, projects that might be motivated by improvements in riverscape health or trying to restore uh, riverscapes. And VBET, uh, we, we are doing some ongoing work with SEEP wetlands that is much more focused on evaluating the outcomes. But as we'll see through the, today's webinar, what VBET really does is sort of set the stage as an objective basis uh, for being able to evaluate those outcomes as as we go forward, and so we'll conclude with just uh, some 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 remarks about how it helps us in that that way. We're going to start with what I'm going to call the blue line problem, and so this is a USGS map, seven and a half minute quad, right? Um, and we can we can look at that. You know, we can zoom in anywhere, and we see those solid blue lines. And we might see some, you know, dash blue lines and we might get out to bigger rivers and we might even see things mapped as little polygons or areas. But rivers are more than just lines and uh, this sort of starting point with how we map this, um, I'm going to argue we've kind of had the wrong legend on our maps uh, where we have this this bias towards just focusing on the channel. And so many of our channels are so much less than they once were and uh, and and highly degraded. And a lot of the habitats that we just heard uh, Danielle and Joe and Jeremy talking about these wet habitats, whether we're talking about wetlands, riparian areas, et cetera, on floodplains, uh, so many of them um, are, are supported when we have connectivity between those channels and those areas. And so this uh, riverscapes, it's not uh, entirely made up word. It's been around since the 1950s, at least in the literature, as popularized in the early 2000s. And obviously it's got to include those blue lines, okay? Um, but it's more than just the blue lines. Um, it uh, should also include those wet habitats that we're interested in, like riparian areas, like wetlands. But what we have today is a small fraction, usually these little remnants along um, the edges of those, those channels, than from what we had, say, pre-European settlement in this country. And so riverscapes are more than just the channels. They're also more than what's there now. Um, and our definition of a riverscape, and we put this into play with the tool, with the valley bottom extraction tool, is it's the part of the landscape that could plausibly flood by, their, uh, by those channels in the contemporary natural flow regime. And so this is a mouthful, um, but plausibly flood is important because that gets us away from just the areas that are allowed to currently flood or um, the, that these channels still have access to. Um, and the natural flow regime also gets us away from things that we've done to manipulate the flow regimes, uh, whether it's impoundments upstream, water withdrawals, extractions, etc. And so it gives us a better basis for the footprint, the part of the landscape um, that could be uh, influenced by uh, moving water. Some riverscapes, uh, particularly those that are more intact and are, let's say, topographically more obvious, uh, are really easy to read, right? I can look at this and I see these kind of clear, you know, breaks in slope. Uh, I can see, you know, breaks in upland vegetation versus sort of riparian and wetland vegetation, clear areas that are flooded. Uh, there's a channel um, even at low flow here flooding because of a beaver dam. And so, you know, riverscapes like this are, are relatively easy to read because when I go and map what's there in terms of existing channels and floodplains, it's obvious. But so many of our riverscapes are not so obvious. Whether on the left, uh, this farmer showing me a picture of his, uh, you know, stream uh, now relegated to a drainage ditch. 
um, or you know, big rivers that we use for navigation, that we extract gravel out of through gravel mining, that we convert a lot of the riverscapes uh, into urban, into uh, various agricultural land uses, ranging from cultivated to, uh, to pastures, et cetera. When we go to these different types of riverscapes, they're harder uh, to read. And if we go back out west here, uh, this some of the places that Jeremy was talking about, we have a lot of riverscapes. In fact, you know, the vast majority, 85% of the network, aren't big, huge rivers. They're smaller, little weightable streams, things like this with a little trickle. And it's like, well, where's the area that could plausibly flood here? Like, I mean, yeah, maybe between the cow pies and there's some green vegetation and a little trickle of water. But, you know, this is a pretty far up and kind of hard to imagine it flooding out here. And then I can look at the vegetation and the vegetation in the West doesn't lie about water availability. Um, you know, sagebrush is not exactly a wetland loving uh, plant. Um, it's an upland species, right? So I see these surfaces with sagebrush and juniper growing on them. And I would be right to conclude that those are not uh, active floodplains. But our definition, and this is that same reach, you know, just pulling out and zooming out here, is how do I find those margins of the area that could plausibly flood if conditions, say, were uh, different? Uh, so we can start by thinking about, you know, what's been lost. And uh, it's easy uh, if we actually map what's there right now. What's there right now, we have in blue here an active channel, not too impressive. Uh, we have a little remnant active floodplain, and it's it's understandable why, as planners, if we're looking for conservation or restoration opportunities, with this massively shifted baseline, we look at these landscapes and we go, oh, well, maybe I could plant a few trees along the edge here and you know get a little more shade on that. Or maybe I'll try and plant something up on this high and dry surface and see if that will survive. Uh, ha ha, without irrigation, forget it. Um, th these uh, sorts of, this shifted baseline, I think most people would think you were crazy if you told them that the area that's been lost uh, extends all the way out to where I have these yellow dashed lines. So mapping what's there right now is easy. Mapping the valley bottom is the harder part for people to see, and that's what we're talking about today. And in this specific example here, this was actually uh, under uh, NRCS's former name, the Soil Conservation Service, coming out of World War II and with all our confidence of winning that and you know, uh, diesel power, we had a lot of projects focused on efficiency and we thought it was a really good thing to straighten channels like this one was. Uh, not surprisingly, this thing cut down, it incised, it, it drained that valley bottom sponge and uh, this is what we're left with. And so what's what's been lost here uh, is this, this part of, uh, of real estate um, that uh, used to support something that looked dramatically different. And this is a all too common story uh, in the West. So the questions that we have going into this, uh, some of what Joe was kind of uh, hinting at and were, were motivated by is like, you know, some basic things that as a steep product, you know, for any producer's riverscape, like, well, where where is the bound of my riverscape? How much How much mileage is actually locked up in that versus mileage locked up in channels? Um, maybe some new ways of emphasizing the space and distance at the same time. Like what are the acres per mile of my riverscape? How wide is it? What's the proportion of the landscape that this occupies? And there's, you know, there, there, there's a bunch of, 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 of motivations that will sort of unpack why these questions are important as we go through here. So we have this challenge, you know, how could we map um, that, that being riverscape, systematically across the West? Uh, through seep croplands, we had a separate project that we, we needed this mapping for, uh, for the entire Mississippi Basin. Uh, with some of the seep wetland stuff, we were extending the effort um, of mapping uh, valley bottoms uh, to the rest of the west. Uh, and so, our, so we had this challenge, we have two thirds of the US, uh, we know that in this blue area, there's 6.8 million miles of channels, but we have no idea how many miles and acres of riverscape there are. Um, and we really want to be able to come to anybody's landscape, any producer, um, and be able to zoom in and understand what the opportunities are uh, for both, you know, in, moving beyond just streams and river channels to meadows, wet, uh, wet meadows, bogs, spring seeps, wetlands. 
as well as understanding better what are the potential risks. And so that brings us to uh, our approach, which was to use this Valley Bottom extraction tool. And uh, the Valley Bottom extraction tool is uh, going to start with what already exists. And what already exists is that blue line network we talked about, that channel network. And we're going to get that from a national hydrographic data set, um, high resolution version. And then we're also going to take topography, which already exists across the, the, the entire um, US. But we want to move beyond this sort of spaghetti, you know, line network. Because you know, one of the things we've learned in a lot of riverscapes is that healthy riverscapes, the position of these channels adjust. And that's really annoying if I'm doing bookkeeping, because I might want to station, you know, river mile, you know, 13.5. And then if the 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 line wiggles or moves or adjusts, you know, like now my stationing's all messed up. And so we're gonna put this through um, our algorithms and we're going to convert that input into lines of evidence that I might be within a valley bottom or uh, a part of the network that could plausibly flood. And so we're gonna move to a polygon network of riverscapes. So our motivation is we just don't know how much of the landscape um, is covered by this. And the significance is, uh, you know, moving to that more real estate perspective, uh, we think, as I've already mentioned, that this gives us a more realistic uh, look at risk um, proposed to producers and infrastructure from safe flooding. Um, and it also um, gives us a, a better idea of what is truly possible from a restoration and, and conservation perspective when And, but you know where might expect channels to adjust the position. Example here um, from a meandering river and just chasing out, uh, tracing out the uh, paths that the channel has taken over time um, in that particular system. So, uh, some jargon for you. We're going to move from a tool we've had for a while in VBET, which was research grade. Um, basically, we were able to publish a paper off it. You know, get people excited. And the way this worked was we could, you know, it's a little GIS tool and, you know, we would go manually download the data one watershed at a time. And, you know, it, on average, it took us maybe for a, a, a Huck Hydrologic Unicode 8 watershed. Uh, those of you that know that it is, it takes a couple days to sort of prep the data and run it and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, my graduate student who has been working on this project, she estimated with the old tool uh, to cover that two thirds of the US that we're looking at, uh, it would only take her 67 years uh, to um, to cover that area that Joe was interested in. Um, and, you know, maybe only 30 million bucks. Um, and so instead the tact that we took uh, was to invest in converting the tool, sort of upgrading it to a production grade tool. And so before I dive into that jargon, just uh, those of you that are old enough to remember having to drive to a video store or to Blockbuster Video and renting a DVD or uh, heaven forbid a VHS if you're that old uh, like me, um, and watching that and then when you're done making sure i don't know you rewinded it or you get it back down to the, the you know the video store and return it that's really the tool that we developed um originally um and there's a bunch of uh, tools out there like this that can kind of ask these questions and run them but not run them over scale what we're talking about now is literally like binge watching your favorite series on netflix and you can get it at any time and uh, you can just watch them all at once or you can watch others and change your mind and blah, blah, blah. And we're literally running our tools that have been refactored on the same platform, on Amazon Web Services, in the cloud, same stuff that's running Hulu and everything else. And um, everything that we're doing has all got open source dependencies instead of you know proprietary stuff. So that's what we're doing. The upshot of that is we've had to spend a fair bit of money, um, a combination of NRCS and BLM's money on refactoring these tools and the development, but what it's done is it's driven the cost to run these things down to a fraction of what it used to. Uh, now, when we run these tools, these uh, we we put them up on uh, the Riverscape Consortium's data exchange, and you can go and you can download, you can search uh, on the map by place, location, you can filter to project types. There's lots of different projects, but uh, VBET is one of them. And so, you know, here, yeah, I found 13,000 projects and you zoom in, find one you might actually be interested in. 
And you don't have to be a GIS expert or even know what GIS is. You can just open um, up in the web viewer a, uh, a map. It's not very fancy, but it just uh, shows the outputs in the context of the inputs and intermediates, uh, which got uh, you to those. So you can sort of uh, evaluate uh, whether or not that's uh, something of, of, of use and makes sense there, but also just get this basic expectation of, all right, well, where where is the riverscape in this area that I've zoomed into? Uh, those of you that want to dork out further can download uh, those uh, projects uh, as a zip file. There's a mix of data in there. Some is GIS and there's other, other stuff. And we have in the viewers, they allow you to uh, easily load those stuff up, um, have them visualized simply. And you can do this with free open source QGIS software. You can do it with stuff we pay way too much money for from Esri. Uh, right now, we only have an ArcMap uh, viewer for the old stuff that's getting deprecated, but by the end of summer, there'll be an ArcPro plugin as well. When you consume those projects, um, it's, uh, it's, it's basically just uh, allowing you uh, to easily navigate the contents that are there and not have to just guess what are all these obscure file names, uh, et cetera, in the zip file. Now, the actual outputs of VBET. So uh, on the left here, sort of the real primary output is not the valley bottom polygons that you might imagine. It's actually a raster that is estimating how likely is every cell in the landscape of being a valley bottom cell. And so here in dark blue and purple, we've got you know areas that are uh, you know highly highly likely of being a valley bottom cell and ranging through different shades of green. And what we do is we take that and we threshold it to get a polygon that is what we're going to call our riverscapes. And so uh, that uh, those polygons in the old version of VBET was just one you know big polygon for everything. Uh, in this version, we've been really interested in well, whose valley bottom is it? And so, is it the valley bottom of some bigger river or a creek that's a tributary to that, or some little tributary that's a tributary to the big creek, or some tiny trip, you know, whatever, whatever it might be? And by uh, segmenting out that uh, polygon into these individual uh, system polygons, it allows you to ask questions like, well, uh, what are the statistics uh, for some river versus some big creek? It also allows us to derive center lines uh, for each of those um, systems independently. And that's what lets us calculate length, right? That question, how, how long are the riverscapes? Um, and so then we can take it a step further and coming back to that idea that I shared with you about, you know, moving from a channel network to a riverscape network or a polyline to polygon network. Well, if we segment along these uh, center lines, uh, those are the yellow dots, and then we can chop up um, into little sample frames um, our valley bottoms. Now, why would we do that? Well, it, me it allows us to calculate locally what we call zonal statistics, or basically like things like, well, how wide is it? Or how long are the channels in it? Or what's the sinuosity of a uh, channel that's in this? Or, uh, you know, what's the uh, proportion of this that is in channel area versus floodplain area? Those sorts of questions. And the way that we do this uh, is we try to have sample frames. Uh, these things have a horrible name, it's not our terminology, discrete geographic objects, DGOs. And so these little polygons, what we try to do is have them sized uh, appropriately for the size of system you're in. So for a bigger system, we might cover something like, you know, 300 meters or 500 meters in like, you know, big, huge river, maybe two kilometers. Whereas in little systems, we might drop down to 100 or 200 meters. And so then we can calculate like, well, what's the area here? What's the area of things that are inside of here? I can count stuff. Like if I have points in here that represent, I don't know, beaver dams, how many are in there? Uh, and then we also have this other thing, which is instead of a discrete geographic object, it's a IGO, an integrated. All that is, is a moving window. And what it means is I can calculate um, uh, some metric based off of not only what's in the cell I'm in, but off of some number of cells upstream and downstream of me. And then I can pick that whole template up and move over to the next one. And so this becomes uh, useful. Uh, so whether it's calculating those very localized metrics, 
uh, in this example, that proportion of the space that's channel, or calculating something where I want some resolution, but I'm just going to pick that moving window up and along um, so that I'm sampling over a more appropriate area to average the, the, the measurement. So here, one of those questions I had, which is, well, how many acres of valley bottom per mile? And we see that little headwater systems may have less than five acres per mile of riverscape, whereas some of these more intermediate size systems may be in this sort of 25 to 100 acres per mile. Okay. In addition to that, VBED exists in uh, what we call like a waterfall of tools. And it starts with uh, some automated tools that hoover up nationally and publicly available data sets and organize them. And then there's some tools that sort of prep things so that we can run VBET. But once we run VBET and we get that polygon network that we just talked about, well, there's a bunch of downstream tools that now can calculate stuff on that. You know, we've got some that look at beaver, some that look at riparian conditions, or like I'm showing here, anthropogenic context. So it might just be like, all right, within my riverscape, what's my land use intensity? Uh, how many road crossings are there? How many points of diversions are there? And so that sample frame then becomes the basis to calculate those things in those downstream models. So that's what VBET is. And now I want to walk you through a couple of examples, okay? So uh, our examples are going to be uh, queries that we can ask at different spatial scales. And so if you are uh, maybe instead of being a planner that works with local landowners, et cetera, um, you're maybe someone that's um, interested in how what you're looking at locally uh, compares to broader spatial scales. And so the project scale that most of us work at on individual restoration projects, conservation projects, you know, uh, working with an individual producer, we're zoomed in down to individual riverscapes, individual little reaches and where they intersect uh, a particular property. But it might be nice to know how do the numbers I get there compare to my whole watershed or what's going on in my state or my region or nationally. And so I'm going to take you to an arbitrary little uh, creek that we can pretend is on somebody's ranch uh, here on Lower Gibbon uh, River. And we're going to then bounce up to uh, the Huck uh, 12 scale, the Huck 10, the Huck 8. So different size watersheds up to the whole Missouri River Basin, uh, you know, and then think about how that compares nationally. And so we're going to just be coming back to these sort of questions and really just filling out this table. So I'm zoomed in here. I'm looking at drainage wings, not the area that flows in from upstream, but the areas that flow in laterally to my little riverscape. I've got my riverscape mapped there. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's covering about, uh, let's see, 0.1 square miles. It's, uh, it's only about 0.8 miles in length. Um, it's uh, 74 acres versus the whole area with the drainage wings is about 980 acres. And so this red line is about 0.8 miles. And within it, you can see the more wiggly channel, which is a little longer at 1.1 miles. And that stat we talked about here for this particular riverscape, this is a 54 acres per mile, and it's covering about seven and a half percent of this little chunk of the landscape we're looking at. So those, I'm not, I'm not getting you to take away those exact numbers, but what I want you to see as we move through these scales is how those uh, currencies um, can can help us sort of frame um, our, our local expectations, our, our projects, and think about uh, risk and opportunities. So. We zoom out um, from the little reach here and from those drainage wings to the bigger uh, watershed that this is part of, this Huck 12, and we can ask those same sorts of questions, right? And so now I've got 4,200 acres of riverscape across this whole area, um, spanning 112 miles of riverscape. And on average, we've jumped, we've we've dropped from where are we, 54 down to 29 acres per mile. Well, does that make sense? Of course it does, because I've got lots of little tiny tributaries that don't have that much acreage averaged with some of the bigger areas. And so um, so we, we sort of dropped down. Um, but the riverscapes are occupying about 10% of this watershed in this uh, mountainous uh, region. We zoom out to the uh, larger 
Huck uh, 10 scale that this is part of. This happens to be the scale that we run our VBET models at and package them up for consumption. And, uh, and here we can play the same sort of games, right? Now I've got 34 acres per mile on average. Well, I'm kind of covering some more rugged terrain. So it's, uh, but also some bigger, uh, bigger valleys as I get lower down in this system. And so that net numbers jumped up a little, uh, 693 miles, right? And so you sort of get the idea. We can, you know, pull out again to the Missouri headwaters uh, subregion. This is a, a Huck 4 and uh, ask the same sorts of questions. And so at that scale, only 4% of the landscape is in Riverscape. Yet when we pull out to the entire Missouri, right? And uh, so now we're going to move from just this little headwaters up in the high Rocky Mountains to the whole Missouri Basin. Now we've jumped up to 20%. Well, that makes sense because we're talking about riverscapes that are set by the base level that the Mississippi has uh, with the ocean. And this uh, landscape is dissected across the, the plains. And so there's a lot more of it that's, that's, that's wrapped up in riverscapes. So when we get in those mountainous regions, the numbers kind of drop down. And when we get out in some of the plains, those numbers can drop, uh, uh, sorry, rise back up. And so, I can't give you national statistics because, you know, we haven't run the rest of this yet. Um, but uh, what I can do is just report that what we've mapped now is there's over 5 million miles of riverscapes in that two thirds of the U.S. If we extrapolate that out, there's probably about 7.7 .7 million miles of riverscape um, total. This is quite interesting. Uh, across this whole blue area, 22% of our landscape is in riverscapes. And you could be saying, well, so what? I don't care about these statistics. Well, remember this. If you care about wetlands, if you care about streams and rivers, et cetera, right now, uh, we, we haven't uh, modeled this directly, but uh, it's sort of extrapolated. But on average, we're probably somewhere between 2 to 4% of the landscape is in those units, is in floodplains, active floodplains, active channels, et cetera. And what this is saying is that historically, it might have been something more like 22%, like an order of magnitude loss. And so when we want to look at risk and we want to look at opportunity, especially in the context of goals that this administration and you know the United Nations have set of 30% conservation uh, by 2030, uh, this is a big part of that portfolio. Um, here, it's roughly 346 million uh, acres that we could be looking at with an average of 50 acres per mile. Now, VBET, we ran this, th th this stuff to get those sort of st stats. And if you wanted to produce those stats, one thing you could do is go download the over 12,000 projects that sit there in that data exchange. It would only take up 4.2 terabytes uh, on your machine. Um, that's absurd and good luck and it'll blow up and fall over. Uh, and what we have instead is a synthesis project that sort of reduces that down to its essence and that you can load up in local GIS or even in uh, free database software uh, that's, that's only 23 gig. And so you can then do very simple things if you're if you're sort of an analyst um, in a matter of seconds. So you can take that big, huge database and you can query it. You could say, well, how much total riverscape network length did we map? That's what I just walked you through. That was the example at different scales, how you can ask that. Well, let's ask it for everywhere we've done it. It's a simple SQL query, right? Some of the length of these things, you a little bit of a little bit of jargon here, you know, getting that from those IGOs, those integrated geographic objects, and boom, you've got your answer in a matter of seconds from, you know, seven, eight lines of code. It's super simple. Uh, so you've got 5.1 million miles that we get out of that. What's the average width across these things? Uh, sorry, uh, 413 feet. That's the average width. So a little more than a, um, than a football field, right? Uh, so like a football field and a third, roughly. And so for those of us that are more visual, um, you can summarize those sorts of statistics at the Huck 10 scale, right? So these are all those smaller watersheds and you can see patterns like, huh, well, where there are lots of mountains, the average riverscape width is less, right? And out in the plains, it's, it's higher. And so you can look at and contextualize these sorts of numbers uh in 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 various ways and so uh there's utility at multiple scales um 
I've th these are some of the, the the original questions that we are posing, and you know I'll you know need to look at the table as much as just understand that that's what it's trying to do is give insights to those. So let's transition and wrap up with um, a couple uh, little examples. So I'm going to take you to the sort of uh, farm ranch scale project of planning with the conservation planning process, and many of you, particularly those of you that are or have been planners within RCS, are probably familiar with the conservation planning process. And uh, Jeremy and I have worked a lot on one way of uh, improving riverscape health uh, using low-tech process-based restoration. It's an adopted practice in NRCS. And this is really making a horrible flow chart even more horrible, but the, with the questions that, that are asked. And so I'm going to zoom into this sort of planning phase, not the design or the doing phase. Um, and you know think about how it is that we can help with this sort of riparian wetland restoration planning you know how we can get towards more of these sorts of values uh less of a lot of what we're facing and we draw on some principles of healthy riverscapes and there are three and the first is really what vbet is all about streams need space the obvious follow-up question is how much space that's what vbet um, tells us what the upper limit on how much space they could do more Do that, does it mean they need all of it no just like is the only thing i can do is be a couch potato or be an olympic athlete like there's a lot of good things in between uh, there's other principles that relate to the role that structure like wood and beaver dams play in making complex and resilient habitats, as well as how inefficiency is ironically a good thing. And the idea is with healthy riverscapes, we get greater biodiversity, self-sustaining form of natural infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, our favorite cop out words in the natural sciences you know, how important these things are, it depends. Well, VBET is one of the things, one of the tools that helps map exactly what it depends on and give us those local expectations. And there's lots of practices, but like I mentioned, low-tech process-based restoration, you know, sticks and stones in the creek um, to try and invoke process to take over uh, is a lot of what we end up doing. And this starts with building a vision, a shared vision with your local producers, your local stakeholders, partners, for how you can go from current conditions to a richer, healthier, more functioning riverscape. And so zooming into that conservation planning process, these are the questions that get tacked on. What part of the valley bottom is available and how do I evaluate risks there? And that is exactly uh, what VBET sort of frames us up to be able to do. We've got, you know, what the maximum recovery potential would be the whole valley bottom, but then we have to go through and map, are there infrastructural constraints limiting us from this? And in this case, you know, we basically want to get more green and blue at the expense of yellow, which here is cheatgrass. And in the left-hand example, we have access to the whole valley bottom, but that isn't always the case. We may have roads, railroads, other land uses that aren't going anywhere. And we need to work with uh, producers to map out what is uh, acceptable and in line. And so VBET sort of frames up that problem. When we're zoomed in, uh, here's an arbitrary little reach. Uh, we sort of start in exercises when we teach classes on this, like getting out Crayolas and just mapping what that valley bottom is. And you know, in this particular example, roughly half of this 146 acres is inactive and so the question is is there any uplift and so i'm going to introduce you to the fictional pops who you know we talk to him and he goes well yeah you know i've thought about this and you know this area in pink is where i would be okay with having uh you guys do some work and having it flood and we have this sort of gap here uh where actually it is flooding it's just on the inside of his fence um those are actually beaver dams um in there and so this is just a situation where maybe there's some uplift within the pink, but in terms of expanding the footprint, that's just not a good match, right? And so maybe we don't do anything here. Uh, and I want you to take away that this idea of recovery potential, it changes with who you're working with and how they view things through time. So maybe Pops is handing over the operations to his daughter, Carol, and she looks at this and she's like, actually, you know what? Yeah, we have a corral, we have a pole barn here, we have a canal, you know, but there is a good chunk of this where her recovery potential polygon, she's saying, look, I could still run cattle in here, that's fine, but we could have a more active floodplain. And so there's actually 22 acres of uplift in that example. So 
the specifics aren't what matters. It's just the process that you can start with expectations from VBAT, and then you can facilitate that conversation uh, with a local producer to arrive at whether or not you might be able to, 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 uh, to tackle some conservation or restoration together. When we come to evaluating outcomes, um, VBET is about con you know, uh, contextualizing, setting the stage. Uh, we have an LTBR Explorer, which is just reporting where you know, people are doing these sorts of things. It's all self-reporting, uh, so it's a huge underestimate. But it does allow us to kind of look at these actions at scale. And so it's not actually the outcome of what are we getting in terms of conservation, but at least where are conservation and restoration actions taking place. And where we're going um, with the current agreement and with uh, new tools is evaluating outcomes where VBET comes in and those sample frames become our basis for monitoring. And so we have a desktop software called Riverscape Studio in, in GIS that allows us to monitor Riverscape health through time and do site scale planning design um, and action effectiveness. And we're also working with Climate Engine and Rangeland Analysis Platform. And uh, we have an API, they have APIs, so application programming interfaces, they just talk to each other. And so uh, you can pull off a time series of what does productivity in your landscape look like in that particular cell um, uh, through, through these platforms. And so that's where we really drive towards uh, evaluating outcomes and that's sort of the next stage of work. But what we wanted to share today uh, is that VBET is available for you to start sort of posing and asking these questions. Uh, we also offer lots of resources and training, uh, for example, on low-tech restoration. These have now been baked into AgLearn, so we do this through Utah State. Uh, we offer these level one and two trainings every spring, and there'll be some advanced stuff actually using these modeling tools coming in the fall of 2025. Overall, I want to just reiterate, uh, like Jeremy said, water is life um, and that healthy riverscapes are more than just channels. So what we've talked about today is really about sort of reimagining what's possible with this bigger sponge, this bigger piece of real estate that can support that life and support producers, um, how it can help them through droughts, um, how it can help with resiliency to fire. So mapping our riverscapes um, is the starting point and VBET's now available for you. And with that, I will stop talking and uh, be happy to field any questions. Great, thank you. That's a lot of information there. <laughs> um, we did get one uh, question in the chat um, that is fairly technical. What what threshold are you using to create the polygons, the the river bottom polygons, and uh, and then further percent certainty, a cell count, or something else? Okay. Um, so the the likelihood we we scale that with um, <laughs> with these with these transform functions that I wasn't in, not going to you know go into. So they're sort of scaled so that we're building the likelihood out, and we're basically our thresholding for the valley bottom at sixty eight percent. And we've independently uh, done some calibration uh, to independent mapping of uh, valley bottoms, both in the field and the desktop, as well as geologic and flood maps. Uh, so if someone's really interested in that, I'd suggest they uh, yeah, get in touch and we can dork out, but uh, I'll, move, I'll let you move on to something else. <laughs> OK. Um... I I had a couple of questions for uh, well the the first one's probably more for Jeremy. Um, you uh, Joe mentioned RAP uh, and um, I think there are a number of tools that were developed by uh, Seep uh, Rangelands and and maybe some of the other components. But uh, how do you uh, how do you see RAP and and maybe VG VGS and those kinds of tools playing or interfacing with VBET in order to really look at what the outcomes of these uh, uh, restorations and and what the potential is? Yeah, sure. Um, 
So the rangeland analysis platform wrap it was born out of a, a SEEP wildlife uh, funding uh, to the University of Montana and some of our working lands for wildlife partners who invented that. It's now under the stewardship of USDA's Ag Research uh, Service. Um, it's an exciting time because just in the last five or six years, we've really seen huge breakthroughs in our ability to remotely monitor the land surface. Um, and so we're leveraging data, uh, big data like Landsat that's you know going around the earth and taking pictures every 14 days. That's all available on the cloud now. And you know that's really unleashed this ability to continuously monitor literally you know every square inch of the, the earth's surface. So we're taking advantage of technology like that. And then with Joe's um, VBET product, you know, providing the context for like, well, what are the bounds of an area that could potentially even be riparian or wetland vegetation? And uh, we can start to ask questions. And so we're really excited to be able to connect those two dots and understand, you know, if we did restoration in this particular ranch, like the one I showed in Nevada, how many more pounds of forage did that produce? How much greener is it during the, the growing season for how long? Those are the types of things we might be able to get to. Um, another question came in. Um, how, how's the plausible flooded area compared to geological, geologic layers like QAL? Yeah, so quaternary alluvium. <laughs> um, uh, so, so stuff in geologic terms, it's more recent. Um, so yeah, it, I'm just scrolling through my extra slides to see if I had, I don't have that right here. Um, but it compares really favorably uh, with that sort of, uh, that, what they call quaternary uh, geologic mapping. Um, not surprisingly, oftentimes that when you're mapping, you know, those sort of quaternary floodplain deposits, uh, those cover a greater space than say your FEMA floodplain and floodway mapping um, would. And so uh, this tends to fare to compare pretty favorably to that. In some places, you know, uh, where the bathtub walls are well defined of the valley bottom, there's a lot of alignment between this geologic mapping and uh, that sort of floodplain mapping. But it's 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 more interesting where the boundaries are a little less clear and uh, What's, what's what's particularly interesting is our stuff actually maps very well compared to what the flood insurance industry, not what FEMA is doing for legality, but what the flood insurance industry actually uses in their hydraulic models to uh, look at risk and uh, figure out how they're gonna sell policies. So long-winded uh, compares well. Uh, a follow-up, and how does the tool inform us about the how disconnected floodplain is from its channel? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, we have other efforts that are looking at that. Um, you could threshold those likelihood surfaces in between, and we do have an intermediate product, which is the uh, relative low areas and relative high areas. But you've got to remember that it's garbage in, garbage out. The algorithm's reasonable, but we're running off of 10 meter DEMs and we find it can do a pretty good job getting the valley bottom margins, but the nuance in especially smaller floodplains, 10 meter resolution data is not enough. Um, as 3DEP comes online and the LIDAR and the high resolution stuff, uh, that does a better job of picking apart that. Uh, as well as some of the other tools that we have for mapping riparian areas and channel adjustments. So VBET directly uh, in this version with the free national available data that's got current coverage, it, it in some systems it does okay if you wanna look at that, but in most you would want higher resolution data for kind of unpacking that or to take a more local site scale analysis. As, as 3DEP becomes more available, um, a lot more is possible. Um, I, we're close to the top of the hour. I, I'll throw out one more, but uh, just so everyone knows, we can have these uh, questions sent on to our speakers and they can uh, hopefully respond. But um, how much you envision this tool being used to prioritize restoration? 
Jeremy, do you want to speak to that? I mean, we are using it a lot already. Sure. You know, it's it's a foundational building block. So I know our team in sagebrush country is going to be exploring how we can combine this with, um, you know, productivity data, you know, uh, from RAP or from uh, other water tools that are being developed to understand, you know, um, the dynamics of these systems. So someone was asking about opportunity for restoration and out West, you know, vegetation greenness is a, is a huge index, uh, an indicator of, of floodplain connectivity because of how dry most of our landscapes are. So we can kind of see the signature of degradation uh, with uh, some of those, those larger data sets. So yeah, we're going to be combining this with other layers to try to hone in on, you know, opportunities for restoration. Yeah, and the Riverscape metric engine, which we did not talk about today, is really what hoovers up a lot of those other data sets and other tools and models and provides that basis for screening, filtering, and prioritization. We're, we're working with both NRCS and a lot now with BLM and their priority restoration landscapes to figure out how to spend and to bill an IRA money um, on parts of the landscape where it makes the most sense. So, so it's just echoing what Jeremy said. Great. Uh, I see Creech dropped a, a link to Riverscape's uh, the tools. Uh, someone asked for that. Um, and again, I, I, I guess I'll turn it over to Laura to kind of close this out, but uh, we can compile the rest of these questions and, and send them on um, and respond uh, after the after we're off offline. Thank you so much, Joe and Jeremy, for that great presentation. Obviously, um, we had great engagement in the Q&A, and so I think our audience really enjoyed it as well. So thank you all for your questions. Um, I also wanted to give a big thanks to Danielle Flynn for her opening remarks and to Joe for the collaboration in this effort. Um, just one last reminder that um, you could visit the Conservation Outcomes Webinar Series webpage to access the recording of this event, as we'll also post those um, great slides that Joe put together as well. Those should be available um, by mid-May. And if you're curious about any additional work that NRCS does to um, inform voluntary conservation outcomes on wetlands, I encourage you to visit the Conservation Effects Assessment Project Wetlands page and that URL, URL is available in the chat. Um, and just one last plug for our next webinar. Uh, it's two o'clock on June 20th during National Pollinators Week. The topic will be pollinators um, and how USDA practices support pollinator services in the US. So more details about that will also be posted on our website. So have a great day. Thanks for joining everybody and I hope you have a good rest of your week.